Thank you, guys. It's good to be here. Thank you all, I should say. Um, I'm going to run through this presentation, and I want to say a couple things. First, I want to thank Ansel and Michael, who, and a lot of the folks at Kleiner Perkins who really helped put this together. This is certainly not a one-person one show, and a lot of people do a lot of heavy lifting. In addition, we have a section on China, uh, compiled by the folks at Hill House Capital, specifically Liang Wu. Um, this is a slide I'm not going to read. Um, as those of you who've seen this before, this is a presentation that it was, is meant to be read, not presented. Um, and so this provides a lot of context on what we're doing, and the presentation is available at kleinerperkins.com. Uh, I encourage you to read it because I will go through this stuff super fast. Um, this is the, um, the, the compilation of things we're going to address. Um, there are a few things we won't get through. We won't get through the advertising section, the enterprise software stuff, and, and, and the comments on USA Inc. and immigration, uh, which the senator addressed in a very thoughtful way. So I'm going to start out with internet devices and users. Growth continues to slow. Global smartphone new, unit, new smartphone unit shipments had 0% growth in 2017 versus 2% growth in 2016. Internet users slowing growth up 7% versus 12% growth in, in the previous year. And global internet users at 3.6 billion surpassed half the world's population in 2018. And the reality of all the, for the business people in the room, when you get to a market, when you get to 50% penetration, new growth becomes a lot harder to find. And that's where the, the industry is at a really high level. That said, internet usage remains pretty solid, up 4% year on year um, with some US data. It's not deduped, so there's a lot of multitasking going on. A lot of people ask the question about internet usage, how much is too much? Our view is it depends on how the time is spent. One of the things I feel really strongly about is there's a lot of innovation and there's a lot of competition and that's driving a lot of product improvements, a lot of usefulness and a lot of usage and also a lot of scrutiny. We put together a list of the key areas where we think there's a lot of innovation going on and there's certainly a lot of growth. I'm going to zip through these really quickly. Devices are getting better, faster and cheaper. Access is rising dramatically. This looks at the expansion of Wi-Fi networks around the world. Products are getting a lot easier to use and they're becoming much more pervasive. Digital pay payments, digital reach is expanding. The portion of people around the world that make payments in any given day in a digital fashion is quite high. Uh, with, it, with payments, friction is declining. Products like messengers and, 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 and also uh, mobile payments are rising dramatically. Uh, and digital currencies are emerging. This looks at the Coinbase user growth. Local uh, online connections are driven by, offline connections are driven by online network effects. This looks at next door's um, neighborhood growth in the US. In messaging, extensibility is expanding. What used to be QQ is now a multidimensional series of, of types of products in the messenger area. With video, mobile adoption is rising very quickly and new content types are emerging. With voice, we've hit technology liftoff with word accuracy, and we've certainly hit product liftoff with Amazon Echo's install base um, estimated to be around 30 million plus. The last area to focus on in innovation and competi competition is personalization. Pers with personalization, data improves engagement and experiences and drives growth and scrutiny. Personal collective data provide better experiences for consumers. There are 2.2 billion Facebooks, 200 million Pinterest, 170 million Spotify's, and 125 million Netflixes. People putting their data into these products to make their experiences better. And then there's the collective data of many other users that affect a lot of real-time products, whether it's Waze or SnapMap or Nextdoor or Uberpool. This all creates a privacy paradox. We tried to simplify it into, into, into really three sentences. Internet companies are making low price services better in part from user data. Internet users are increasing their time on internet services based on perceived value. And regulators want to ensure data is not used improperly. And not all regulators think about this in the same way. When we look at, um, at Facebook, the company is experiencing um, uh, higher engagement on the product and that drives monetization for the company and it drives investment in product improvements and when you have rising monetization, rising growth and rising data collection drives a lot of regulatory scrutiny whether it's related to data privacy, competition or safety and content. For the internet companies it's key to understand in all this stuff and it's very complex. We're in the middle of it all right now and will be for a long time to come. It's important to understand the unintended consequences of the products 
Uh, this is Mark Zuckerberg's quote um, in April. I said we did not focus enough on preventing abuse and thinking through how people could do these tools to do harm as well. The unintended consequences apply to regulators as well. Uh, this is a comment from Bloomberg Opinion Editorial. As it comes into force, Europe with GDPR should be mindful of unintended consequences and open to change when things go wrong. While it's crucial to manage for unintended consequences, it's also irresponsible to stop innovation and progress, especially in a, in a, in a world where there are a lot of countries that are doing different things. I want to drill down on the U.S. Internet leaders. They've been aggressive and forward-thinking investors for years. This looks at private money into public companies and IPOs of companies over the last, um, beyond the last couple of decades, but money in has been quite, quite significant. Tech companies have risen to 25% of the market cap of the MSCI, um, and it, that's been a steady increase. The tech companies account for six of the top 15 R&D and CapEx spenders in the U.S., with Amazon, Google Alphabet, Intel, Apple, and Microsoft in, in, in the top five slots. And these companies, including Facebook, are the fastest growing um, spenders as well on that list. If we look at tech companies versus other industries in the United States, Tech companies are the largest, fastest growing R&D and CapEx spenders. The blue line looks at, ta at tech, a 9% compound average growth rate in, in R&D and CapEx spending over the last 10 years. Healthcare at 4% and discretionary at 0%. It's just interesting to compare what, what the growth rates are in the different industries. Tech companies have uh, R&D and CapEx is also rising as a percent of revenue at 18% versus 13% in 2000 and 2007. A lot of competition, a lot of R&D spending and CapEx spending driving a lot of innovation and growth. I'm going to switch to e-commerce. Uh, the transformation continues to accelerate. E-commerce revenue uh, was up 16% in 2017 in the U.S. versus 14% the previous year. Share gains versus traditional retail continue to rise at 13% for e-commerce. Amazon.com e-commerce share gains continue at 28% versus 20% in 2013. E-commerce evolving and scaling. When we think about e-commerce today, it's often mobile, interactive, personalized, in the feed, in the inbox, and also often at the front door. We wanted to look at the stack of e-commerce just to give you a sense of some of the numbers and trends around how people are building stores uh, and conducting commerce online. Oftentimes, offline merchants want to set up a payment system. A lot of times, they'll start at a company like Square. Square has 2.8 million active sellers on its platform, we estimate. Uh, a lot of times when people want to start, develop a, an online store, they'll go to a service like Shopify, about 600,000 active merchants on their platform, integrated payment systems, Stripe, integrate f fraud protection, integrate purchase financing, integrate customer support, find customers, and get products to the customers. This, this industry, for the most part, has emerged over the course of the last five years, and there's no better indication, in our view, of how vibrant it is and how intensely competitive it is that Shopify has set up a storefront exchange where you can buy and sell online stores um, that have been created on the platform. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how people find products and how that evolves. Search leads on the Internet. Most people start at search at either Amazon or, or a search engine like Google. With product finding at Amazon, it started at search, fulfilled by Amazon. Product finding at Google started at search, fulfilled by others. Discovery is emerging as a, as a way to find products, especially on places like Facebook and Instagram, started at personalized discovery in the feed, and it's getting more data-driven, personalized, and a lot more competitive. Google, in effect, is evolving from an ad platform to a commerce platform. Amazon is evolving from a commerce platform to an ad platform. If we look at the e-commerce related advertising revenue on Google, Amazon, and Facebook, it is significant. Four billion on Amazon in the last year, up 42%. And Facebook has more than 80 million small but medium-sized businesses on its site, up 23% year to year on its service, um, endeavoring to reach out to customers. Social media is enabling more efficient product discovery in commerce. A material portion of people that have used social media have found products on social media a material portion, portion have purchased those products after finding them on social media. If we look at e-commerce referrals on, from social media, they're at 6% versus 2% in 2015, dry, rising very quickly. There are a large number of companies that are emerging DTC retailers and brands that have used social media to get to 
uh, very, to have experienced very rapid levels of revenue growth. This looks at the number of companies that have gotten to 100 million in revenue uh, in less than six years. For, with social media, ad engagement is rising, represented by Facebook's e-commerce click-through rates, which are rising. Return on ad spend, the cost is rising faster than the reach, but both are still rising. The key thing that people are focused on in, in, this, in this area is customer lifetime value. The importance is rising as customer acquisition costs increase. And lifetime value divided by customer acquisition costs is increasingly an important metric for retailers and brands. Data-driven personalization recommendations are in the early innings at scale. We look at the evolution of commerce um, over the last um, number of years, starting with demographic targeting with catalogs, brands, um, with department stores and malls, then we call it utility commerce, transactional commerce on the internet, you search for stuff, and now it's increasingly personalized e-commerce, curated product discovery, 24-7 recommendations. One of the best examples of that is, is Stitch Fix. Product purchases in e-commerce, many are evolving from buying to subscribing. This looks at some of the companies that have subscription service revenue growth that is pretty, and numbers that are pretty compelling driven by access, selection, price, experience, and personalization. One of the best examples of a company in this area is Spotify, which had 45% of its monthly active users are subscribers versus 0% when they launched, the, they launched the subscription product 10 years ago. And that's primarily been driven by a really great user experience. Shopping is increasingly entertainment. Mobile shopping usage is one of the fastest growing areas of, of app sessions um, on, on, out there. Um, product and price discovery is often video enabled. Product and price discovery is increasingly social and gamified. Physical retail trending, long-term sales um, is, are, are on a decelerating trend. And then there's, there's China and there's new retail, um, um, which Alibaba is really leading with. Alibaba is leading an e-commerce ecosystem born in China. If we compare Alibaba and Amazon.com, they have similar focus areas up and down the stack. Alibaba has much higher GMV, uh, gross merchandise volume, and um, Amazon has much higher, higher revenue. I'm gonna quote some stuff from Alibaba because not everybody may be familiar with what, how, how they view this, this um, new area of retail called new retail, but it's, I'm gonna summarize this in some of their words. It's fair to say that our e-commerce platform is fast becoming the, retail, the leading retail infrastructure of China. Alibaba's marketplace platforms handle billions of transactions each month. We have the best insights into consumer behavior. We have deep technology and a comprehensive ecosystem of commerce platforms, logistics, and payments. Alibaba is increasingly extending its platform beyond China with both acquisitions and equity investments. Um, and as of uh, 2007, about 8.4% of its revenue was outside of China versus 7.9% um, in the previous year. Um, our friends at Hill House Capital provided us, as they usually do, with um, some thoughts on China. I'm going to run through these really quickly. Uh, China in e-commerce, it has the number one in e-commerce sales as a percent of, of total sales at 20%, highest in the world and, and, and the fastest growing. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple of, of areas of commerce that are unique to China. Um, one is a, 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 a business called Hermes Stores, which is basically reimagining uh, the grocery business, I'll let you look at the pictures for a moment. It looks like a uh, very fun, interactive um, grocery store. And the thing that is most interesting about it from a financial standpoint um, is that a very material portion of their revenue comes from off online purchases where people purchase things on online and either pick up or have the item sent to them. And subsequently, their transactions per store are materially higher than uh, many of their off pure offline competitors. Also a company called Bell, which is a shoe store, um, which has um, uh, sensors all over the place. Um, they know where people spend time in the store, so they know where to place their products. They have RFID chips in shoes, so they know when people try on the shoes what the percentage take rate is of, of purchasing the shoes. Uh, and you can also scan your shoe to get a sense of which shoes uh, may fit you best. Um, video and entertainment in China. Uh, data usage is rising dramatically. It's actually accelerating 162% versus 124% in the previous year. Um, mobile entertainment time spent. Mobile video is by far and away the fastest growing area of media and entertainment time spent in China. This looks at short form video with the blue line and daily time spent in China growing very rapidly. Um, there are several companies in China that have more than 100 million DAUs that are sh focused on short form video. 
if we look at long form video, the internet enabled budgets surpassed the TV network budgets um, in 2017. Um, and in China, there are a number of online uh, long form video providers um, that have reached tens of millions of, of paying subscribers in China. And it, additionally, an interesting observation is that um, the number one uh, multiplayer video game in China uh, is team based, uh, which is um, a new thing for the Chinese market over the last five years. Moving from China back to the US which is a little bit of an interesting segue. Um, moving, it, want to focus on consumer spending. The dynamics are evolving and the internet is, is creating a lot of opportunities in our view. For consumers, making ends meet is difficult. Household debt is at the highest level ever and rising. Student debt is the highest grower. Uh, auto follows and mortgage is actually down uh, versus the, the previous peak in the third quarter of 2018. Personal saving rate, at 3% versus 12% 50 years ago, and the debt to annual income ratio is rising at 22% versus 15% 50 years ago. I want to look at how relative household spending has shifted over the past half century. Uh, this looks at data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics and compares uh, census data that looks at relative household spending for areas like shelter, taxes, transportation, food. We, we look at 1972, 1990, and 2017. The things that are rising in a big way include shelter, pensions, insurance, and in healthcare, and the things that are falling on a relative basis are food, entertainment, and apparel. I want to drill down on food for just a moment, but it's 12% versus 15% of household spending 28 years ago. Um, grocery store price growth at the margin is on a declining trend, and one of the reasons for that is Walmart. Uh, Walmart helped reduce grocery prices via technology and scale and subsequently gained a lot of, of share in, in that marketplace. E-commerce is helping reduce prices for consumers. This is a quote from Austin Goolsby at the University of Chicago. Online prices are falling absolutely in relative to traditional inflation measures like the CPI. This is data from Adobe that indicates that over the past two and a quarter years, online prices on average have fallen 3% versus 1% for offline prices. The biggest area per Adobe of price declines have been TVs, furniture, computers, and sporting goods. Uh, and this is a quote from Hal Varian. It says, we've seen how technology can make online shopping more efficient with lower prices, more selection, and increased convenience. And this is about to happen to, off ha about to, happen to offline shopping. Drilling down a little bit more on spending, uh, we indicated that shelter spending has been rising on a relative basis for consumers. That's what it looks like in the blue, red, and green. Specifically, in U.S. cities are much less densely pop populated than the rest of the world. South Korea, 17 times more densely populated in cities in the U.S., Japan, nine times, the U.K., six times. Average home sizes in the United States are materially larger than they are in, in, in other places around, most places around the world. And U.S. homes are getting bigger while residents per home are, are falling. Um, U.S. office space is getting denser and a bit more efficient. Um, shelter to contain spending. Many consumers may aim to increase the utility of space they have. We just provided some examples of how some consumers are doing this. Airbnb provides income opportunity for hosts. There are an estimated um, 500,000 individuals in the U.S. that have listings on, on Airbnb. I'm going to drill into that a little bit later. Um, Five million listings around the world for consumers. Airbnb can offer lower prices for overnight accommodations. Looking at transportation, spending is actually relatively flat. There are a lot of reasons for that, including oil prices. Um, but consumers are reducing their relative spend on vehicles and increasing utility of the vehicles that they have. Vehicles are, stay on the road for 12 years versus eight years in 1995. And public transit use is rising and ride share um, use is rising as well. Uber is a company that can provide op work opportunities for driver partners, about a million um, Uber driver partners in the U.S. and three million around the world, and it can also benefit consumers in um, in urban settings. Lower commute costs for, versus personal cars in four of the five largest cities in the U.S. Healthcare spending. Uh, no, uh, my partner at, at Kleiner Perkins, Noah Knopf, pulled this together. I think it's pretty thoughtful. It looks at healthcare spending, um, and healthcare spending is increasingly shifting to consumers. U.S. healthcare insurance costs are rising for all. Consumers are paying a higher portion of their insurance costs at 18% versus 14% in 1999, and deductible costs are rising a lot as well. The number of employees that have a $2,000 deductible 
uh, or greater is at 22% versus 7% in 2009. When customers start spending more, they tend to pay more attention to value and prices, especially with things like the internet. And our question is, will market forces finally come to healthcare and drive prices, prices lower for consumers? I'm gonna run through some examples of where it is happening and the trend, these numbers are still small, but they're trending in the right direction. Uh, modern retail experience, One Medical growing its office locations, digital healthcare management, Oscar on-demand pharmacy capsule, women's healthcare specific solutions, Nurex, transparent pricing, Dr. Consulta, not a US based company, and simplified healthcare billing with, with Cedar. Uh, and we asked the question, the consumeration, consumerization of healthcare and rising data availability, may we finally be at the cusp of reducing consumer healthcare spending? I certainly hope so. Work is changing rapidly. The internet is helping so far. Technology disruption is not new, and technology disruption is accelerating. The internet was adopted faster than the PC, faster than the TV, faster than the telephone. What are the drivers of this? Rising and cheaper compute power and storage capacity, and rising and cheaper connectivity and data sharing. New technologies have created and displaced jobs historically. Concerns have ebbed and flowed over time. Um, aircraft jobs have replaced locomotive jobs. Services jobs replaced agriculture jobs. And agriculture is it was less than 2% of the jobs in the United States versus 41% in 1900. Over the past 70 years, which is the period for which we have data, new technology concerns have ebbed and flowed, GDP has risen, and unemployment has ranged between 3 and 10%. Will technology impact jobs differently this time? Perhaps, would it be, but it would be inconsistent with history as new jobs and services plus efficiencies plus gr growth typically create, are created around new technologies. The job market is solid based on traditional high-level metrics in the U.S. Unemployment is at 3.9% well below the 5.8% 70 years ago. And consumer confidence is high and rising. The index is at 100 versus 87, 55 year, the 55 year average. Job openings at a 17 year high at 7 million, three times higher versus the 2009 trough. And job growth is much stronger in urban areas where 86% of Americans live at rising. Labor force participation is at 63%. Well, or not well below, but 3.5 million people below the 64% 50-year average. What's the most common activity for people that don't work? Leisure, household activities, and education. Job expectations are evolving. The most desired non-monetary benefit for workers is flexibility. Technology makes freelance work and other forms of work easier to find. Freelance work is growing three times faster than growth for the total workforce. On-demand jobs, these are big numbers and the growth is high. We spent a lot of time pulling this stuff together um, and this is one of the first areas where we've seen it done in, in this way. On-demand workers, 5.4 million estimated in 2017 per Intuit, up 23% year on year, estimated to be around 6.8 million in 2018. These are big numbers. Um, on-demand jobs, there have been more than 15 million applicants on the checker background check platform since 2014 for on-demand jobs. This looks at some of the numbers for some of the platforms. We've already gone through a few of these, but Etsy has 2 million sellers, Upwork has 16 million freelancers, um, and there are a lot of numbers from a, a lot of similar numbers from other players in the marketplace. On-demand jobs are filling needs for workers who want extra income, flexibility, and have underutilized skills and assets. This is data from Intuit that compiles what the general view is on, on what the basics and the benefits are of um, on-demand work, number one and two are extra income and flexibility. I'm gonna drill through, through, drill, drill through some of the specifics for some of the companies. Um, at Uber, 87% use Uber to set their own hours, 85% um, do for work-life balance, and 74% do it, use drive on Uber to maintain steady income. On Etsy, 99.9% .9 of U.S. counties have Etsy sellers, 97% operate at home, 28% operate from a rural location, 27% have children at home, and 68% say their motivation is the creativity that related to Etsy selling, creating and selling uh, provides happiness. Airbnb, 57% of hosts use the earnings to, actually, to stay in the home um, that, they are, that they are listing. Bill Gurley had a great quote about a month ago that described Uber in the on-demand marketplace, which I'll read. No Uber driver partner is ever told where or when to work. This is quite remarkable. An entire global network miraculously level loads on its own. 
driver partners unilaterally decide when they want, when they want to work and where they want to work. The flip side is also true. They have unlimited freedom to choose when they do not want to work. The Uber network is able to elegantly match supply and demand without schedules and shifts. That worker autonomy of both time and place simply does not exist in other industries. The bottom line is on-demand and internet-related jobs. The scale is becoming significant in the US and in other parts of the world. Data gathering and optimization. It's been years in the making. It's increasingly global and competitive. It accelerates with computer adoption, really started with a mainframe in the early 1950s, uh, and started with government mainframe deployment, gathering data for Social Security, for NASA, for the IRS. And some of the great companies of the last several generations in the US um, did the same thing, whether it was Bank of America to process checks or Aetna to optimize insurance policies, Visa to create and manage the merchant network, or Walmart to track inventory and logistics. Data gathering, optimization, and sharing is, also, is again accelerating with computer adoption. This time it's with consumer mobiles and in the, in, in, in the cloud. We've lived through two computing big bangs. The cloud started in 2006 by Amazon AWS and consumer mobile uh, with the Apple iPhone in 2007. This looks at the data behind those platforms. Uh, AWS, number of services on the platform and the number of apps on the, in, the, in, the Apple, uh, Apple, um, for, for in the Apple App Store. Uh, computing big bang volume effects, cloud compute cost declines continue, and cloud revenue, service revenue is actually accelerating of 58% uh, year on year. Data gathering, sharing, optimization enabled by consumer mobile adoption, social media adoption, and sensor pervasiveness. Um, the amount of this that is, um, exists is growing at a, at a torrid pace. Data can be an important driver of customer satisfaction. If we look at the US companies that carry a market cap in excess of 100 billion, they have relatively high customer satisfaction scores according to ASCI. The market average is 77 uh, for the fourth quarter of last year. Amazon's at 85, Google Alphabet's at 82, Netflix is at 79, Booking.com, Priceline is at 78, um, Facebook, Instagram is at 72. Google personalization and queries via queries drive engagement and customer satisfaction. Um, Spotify personalization preferences drive engagement and customer satisfaction. Totuyao, uh, um, help me out here. Totiwao, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry, I think I got it right. Um, interests are driving engagement and customer satisfaction, growing very rapidly um, with artificial intelligence. Um, data improves predictive ability of many services. Data volume is foundational to algorithmic refinement and, and, um, and AI performance. It's foundational to tool and product improvement, artificial intelligence predictability and capability. Artificial intelligence service for platforms are emerging from internet leaders. Amazon.com and Google are increasingly competing in the space. A Amazon's AI platform emerging from AWS, enabling easier data processing and collection for others. Google doing the same thing from the Google Cloud. AI and enterprises is a small area, but it's one of the rapidest um, areas of spending growth in, in the market. Sundar at Google said AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than electricity or fire. We have learned to harness fire for the benefits of humanity, but we had to overcome its downsides too. AI is really important, but we have to be concerned about it. Data sharing creates multifaceted challenges. Love this comic, um, but it's very serious. Data and consumers have a love-hate relationship. The quote is, just because I hate you doesn't mean I don't love you. Data and consumers. Uh, most online consumers share, are willing to share data for benefits, 79% willing to share personal data for a clear personal benefit, uh, but, but consumers also take actions when the benefits of data are not clear, 64% according to Deloitte deleted and avoided certain apps because of data concerns. As was mentioned last night, uh, the internet companies are making consumer privacy tools much more accessible, looking at Facebook's change and Google's change, bringing the privacy tools uh, to the fore from, from, the, from the rear. Data sharing, there are a lot of different views. The EU, Asia, and Americas are rising their regulatory focus on data collection and sharing, while China is encouraging data collection. Cybersecurity is also another actor. Cyber, th cyber threats are also another area where people have a different view on data and privacy, malware volume rising dramatically. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on global inter internet leadership, the US and China, economic leadership, 
China and India and the U.S. are the only markets that are, have um, relative GDP that is rising. Others are falling. Cross-border trade continues to be very important. Internet leadership, a lot's happened over the last five to 10 years. This looks at today's top 20 internet leaders five years ago. Nine of them were in the U.S., two were in China. Today, 11 are in the U.S., nine are in, Ch in China, uh, China obviously gaining very rapidly. Smartphones, China is the number one worldwide OEM of smartphones at 40% versus 0% share 10 years ago, while the U.S. has gone to 15% share from 3%. Internet globally, the US, the U.S. platforms lead in numbers, more than 2 billion users of Facebook platforms and Google, while Tencent and Alibaba have 1 billion and 700 million respectively. If we look at those same interuse, internet users and look at them by country, the country that has the largest number of the, the the market, the global player that has the largest number of leader, leaders in e, the number of users in each platform is Tencent in China and Alibaba. No one has a peer in the volume of, of usage and users they have in a single country other than Tencent and Alibaba. Um, feature and data rich platforms, um, Tencent and Alibaba look at the user, the UI. And China internet users are more willing to share data for benefits versus other countries in the world by a wide margin. China's digital volume is at a significant scale, is growing fast and providing fuel for rapid artificial intelligence advancements. If we look at AI in the US and China and look at the competitions, China is increasingly winning um, the complex tasks and the competitions that take place. This looks at graduates um, from bachelor's equivalent degrees and doctoral degrees, China in the red, um, US in the, in, in the blue, and EU in the yellow, and China trending very strongly. Uh, and the Chinese government is very focused on developing artificial intelligence. This is a quote from Eric Schmidt, and Kara, you'll be happy I'm almost done here. Um, I'm assuming that US, the U.S.'s lead in artificial intelligence will continue over the next five years and that China will catch up extremely quickly. Um, I'm going to close on some economic growth drivers, how they evolve over time. We're clearly in the period of compute power and human potential. Lifelong learning is crucial in evolving the evolving work environment. The tools are getting better and more accessible. Coursera has 33 million learners, up 30% year on year. The top courses, machine learning, neural networks, and deep learning, introduction to mathematical thinking, algorithms, uh, neural networks, et cetera. Lifelong learning, educational content usage is ramping very fast. YouTube has more than a billion views of daily learning videos. 70% of users use the platform to help solve work, school, or hobby problems. Lifelong learning, employee, re re employee retraining is high at some companies. In my view, AT&T is the best example. 77% of its workforce is actively engaged in retraining, most of it web-based. That's 194,000 people at AT&T. Uh, and lastly, lifelong learning, 50, greater than 50% of freelancers updated their skills within the past six months compared with 30% um, for uh, non-freelancers. I'm going to close with three words, change, opportunity, and responsibility. We're living in a period of unprecedented change and unprecedented opportunity, and especially for the people in this room, unprecedented need for responsibility. And with that, thank you. <laughs>